Hello. In a previous video, we talked about intuitive understanding of Miller compensation using idealized amplifier stages. In this video, we will consider a two-state CMOS amplifier and see how Miller compensation affects the design choices. Here we have most commonly used two-state CMOS amplifier topology. Single-ended differential amplifier makes the first stage and PMOS common source amplifier is the second stage. Both stages are biased by current sources which are actually part of a common current mirror which is not shown here. If we trace the signal path, there are three nodes. So correspondingly, there are three poles in this circuit. We also notice that signal can reach to V2 from two paths. So we have one zero as well. We know it is left hand plane zero because both signal reach here with the same phase. In fact, this pole at node V1 and this zero makes a pole zero doublet, which is also known as mirror pole zero doublet. Frequency of zero in this doublet is exactly double of that of frequency of the pole. This relationship makes intuitive sense because pole at node V1 shorts the V1 node and this halves the first stage gain. Since these pole zero doublets are closely placed, they tend to cancel each other's effect. At the same time, pole at V1 is a high frequency pole because of the presence of this diode connected transistor which makes this node a low impedance node. Long story short, although there are three poles in this circuit, we can ignore the pole at node V1. So let's now talk about other two poles. Resistance at node V2 is the parallel combination of resistances of transistor M2 and transistor M4. This resistance value is usually in mega ohms. Capacitance at node V2 Although shown here as a separate capacitor C1, comprises of gate capacitance of M5, drain to bulk and drain to gate capacitances of M2 and M4, and metal routing parasitic capacitors. This capacitance can be as small as a few femtofarads and in extreme cases may be a few picofarads. So now we can write the equation of pole frequency at node V2. To complete the set of equation for the first stage, we can also write the equations of gain and gain bandwidth product. In these equations, GM is the GM of input transistor M1 or M2. Now coming to the second stage or output stage, the resistance at node VO is the parallel combination of resistances of M5 and M6. In a typical amplifier, this resistance can be several hundreds of kilo ohms or a few mega ohms. Coming to capacitor C2, it primarily mates of capacitances of following stages. It can be an actual physical capacitor or the capacitances offered by many input stages. This capacitance is usually in few picofarads and in extreme cases, for example, in case of LDO, can even be in microfarads. So let's write the equations for second stage. So here we notice that the equations of second stage are very similar to equations of the first stage. Also notice that the gain of second stage is inverting, which is a mandatory requirement for the Miller compensation. Also keep in mind that these poles are left hand plane poles. So there should be a minus sign with it, which I have omitted here for the sake of simplicity. So let's now insert a Miller capacitor and see how things change. We know that Miller compensation causes pole splitting. That means one pole will move to the lower frequencies and other pole would move to the higher frequencies. At the same time, this Miller capacitor also causes right hand plane zero. So let's write the equations for new pole and zero locations. We have seen these equations in an earlier video, except I have started with a more accurate expression of the second pole. I will use this accurate equation later, but for the moment I'll work with the more simpler and familiar equation. So let's also write the equations for the gain and gain bandwidth product. So let's now consider the design problem in our hand. In these types of design problem, capacitor C2 is usually given as a specification. So we don't have much control over the value of C2. The minimum value of transconductance of transistor M5 is usually fixed by speed and bandwidth requirement. Value of C1 is set by the sizes of M5, M2 and M4. So it's a design outcome. 
द प्राइमरी डिजाइन ऑब्जेक्टिव इज ऑफ कोर्स टू फाइंड द मिनिमम वैल्यू ऑफ कॉम्पनसेशन कैपेसिटर सी सी टू मीट द स्टेबिलिटी रिक्वायरमेंट्स सो इन रेस्ट ऑफ द वीडियो वी विल एज्यूम सी टू टू बी द फिक्स पैरामीटर एंड सी सी एंड वेरियस ट्रांस कंडक्टेंसेज टू बी द डिजाइन पैरामीटर्स सो वेयर डू वी स्टार्ट सो रिकॉल दैट फॉर एन एडिकुएटली स्टेबल सिस्टम सेकेंड पोल शुड बी एट और बियॉन्ड गेन वैन विथ प्रोडक्ट सो लेट स्टार्ट फ्रॉम देयर सो बाई वर्किंग आउट दिस कंडीशन वी अराइव एट द लोअर लिमिट ऑफ द कॉम्पनसेशन कैपेसिटर सो दिस कंडीशन सेज दैट कॉम्पनसेशन कैपेसिटर शुड बी एट लीस्ट फर्स्ट स्टेज टू सेकेंड स्टेज जी एम रेशियो टाइम्स द आउटपुट कैपेसिटर सो दिस मीन्स दैट इफ यू वॉन्ट टू मिनिमाइज द कॉम्पनसेशन कैपेसिटर देन वी नीड टू मिनिमाइज दिस जी एम रेशियो सेंग डिफरेंटली जी एम ऑफ सेकेंड स्टेज शुड बी मच लार्जर दैन जी एम ऑफ फर्स्ट स्टेज प्लगिंग सम नंबर्स इफ आउटपुट कैपेसिटर इज टेन पीको फेरेड एंड ट्रांस कंडक्टेंस ऑफ आउटपुट स्टेज इज फाइव टाइम्स बिगर दैन ट्रांस कंडक्टेंस ऑफ इनपुट स्टेज दैन इट सेट्स अ लोअर लिमिट टू कॉम्पनसेशन कैपेसिटर एज टू पीको फेरेड बट दे इज अनदर मोर स्ट्रिक्ट कंडीशन दैट मैंडेट्स दैट आउटपुट कैपेसिटर शुड बी बिगर दैन द कॉम्पनसेशन कैपेसिटर रिकॉल दैट द सिंपल मिलर कॉम्पनसेशन प्रोड्यूसेज अ राइट हैंड प्लेन जीरो विच इज अ बैड न्यूज फॉर द सर्किट स्टेबिलिटी we need to keep this right hand plane zero as far as possible from the second pole and when we plug in the equations we find that this requires that output capacitor should be much larger than compensation capacitor so we see that it's not only desired but absolutely vital for the circuit stability that compensation capacitor is smaller than the output capacitor in fact this condition puts a requirement on this circuit that output stage transconductant has to be bigger than input stage transconductance right well so why not to just make the input transconductance very 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 small after all it would also save us area and power well the reason we cannot do that is that there are many parameter which benefit from the larger first stage transconductance for example input refer noise and offset and slew rate as well so a more practical value of this transconductance ratio is 3 to 5 maybe 10 in the extreme cases so a very useful rule of thumb is given an output capacitor start with 1/5 of this capacitor as compensation capacitor so we see that there is a lower limit to the compensation capacitor which ensures adequate pole splitting if compensation capacitor is less than this value then we may not have adequate phase margin at the same time there is a well defined upper limit to compensation capacitors which makes sure that right hand plane zero is far away a good way to visualize this situation is to plot pole and zero location as we change the compensation capacitor from a very low value to very high value so it is a log log curve where we have frequency in the logarithmic scale in the x axis and compensation capacitor in logarithmic scale in the y axis for very low value of compensation capacitor the pole frequency hardly move and they remain at their uncompensated values we start to notice the pole splitting when miller multiplication starts to dominate the input capacitance as we increase the compensation capacitance value from this value one pole starts to move in and other pole starts to move out as we further increase the compensation capacitor the inner pole or the dominant pole keeps reducing but the outer pole or non dominant pole becomes independent of compensation capacitor as we keep on increasing the compensation capacitor the right hand plane zero also starts to come into the picture the outer pole frequency and the right hand plane zero frequency become equal when compensation capacitor roughly becomes equal to the output capacitor so from this plot we can make out the useful range of compensation capacitor compensation capacitor value should be less than this value maybe below this green line at the same time it should be large enough to cause adequate pole splitting so here this shaded region shows the useful range of compensation capacitor okay now let's compare the unity gain frequency before and after compensation as we have seen in some of the previous videos unity gain frequency before compensation is given by this equation we can approximate unity gain frequency after compensation by its gain bandwidth product we can now take the ratio of these two quantities 
So after some simplification we get this equation. To make sense of the first term of this equation recall the condition of lower limit of compensation capacitor. We can infer from this condition that this first term is less or equal to 1. Looking at this term the capacitor C1 is almost always a few times less than Cc. So we can infer from this discussion that unity gain frequency after simple Miller compensation is always a few times less than before compensation. We can come to same conclusion from another argument. This time we consider product of two poles before and after compensation. This time we have taken a more accurate expression of the second pole after frequency compensation. So let us take the ratio of these two pole products. And this ratio is clearly less than 1. In fact we can rearrange the ratio to get a better insight. And to give some feel of the numbers I have assumed that the compensation capacitance is 3 times less than the output capacitance and similarly input capacitance is 3 times smaller than the compensation capacitance. So by even this conservative estimate this ratio is about a quarter. And if you give it some thought this implies that unity gain frequency after compensation is significantly less than before compensation. Ok, so now let us summarize the simple Miller compensation. By far the biggest advantage of simple Miller compensation is the small size of compensation capacitor because of the Miller multiplication. Another advantage is that unlike dominant pole frequency compensation there is no pole zero doublet in the frequency response. This means a clean settling behavior. Despite these advantages, simple Miller compensation is rarely, if ever, used in actual practical designs. The biggest just advantage is right hand plane 0, which makes frequency compensation really challenging. The reduced bandwidth after compensation is another undesirable effect. Simple Miller compensation is also known to cause poor power supply rejection in the amplifier. The reason behind this is simple to understand. As we have seen in a previous video, as we increase the frequency, the compensation capacitor creates a short between gate and drain of this output transistor. So this transistor effectively becomes a diode connected transistor which passes all the ripple of supply to the output. Even though you will probably never use the simple Miller compensation in an actual design, the time spent to understand this compensation technique is not wasted. This is because simple Miller compensation is the basis of host of many other compensation techniques which resolve the problem caused by simple Miller compensation at the same time keeping the advantages. We will look at some of these techniques in the coming videos. So post your comment below for this video and thanks for watching.